things have to be changed, and I'm fighting for change. Tonight, the latest on the investigation into the death of a woman at an Alberta hospital. We spend at least $1,200 oh, a month at that mall in an effort to support our brothers and sisters. We'll hear from a Bear Clan member banned from an Edmonton mall. There's no point in sending um, professionals that don't have the skill sets or are unequipped to deal with the kinds of tasks that the community is looking for. And we'll bring you the latest update on the situation in a Northern Ontario First Nation dealing with an Omicron outbreak. Good evening, I'm Dennis Ward. Welcome to APTN National News. The federal government gave an update Thursday on what it is doing to support Indigenous communities during the latest wave of the COVID-19 pandemic. The Liberals have been under fire in recent days for not reacting quickly enough to help a Northern Ontario First Nation struggling with a major outbreak. Here's Fraser Needham with an update. The Bearskin Lake First Nation has been asking for military support since late December. It took more than a week for the government to respond to this request. The First Nation says it still does not have the kind of outside military support they need. Indigenous Services Minister Patty Haydew says her department has been working closely with the First Nation. She says she understands Bearskin Lake's frustration and had this to say. It's really important before, obviously, any deployment of uh, professionals that we send the right ones. There's no point in sending um, professionals that don't have the skill sets or are unequipped to deal with the kinds of tasks that the community is looking for. That's the nature of the kinds of conversations that are happening, as I said, once or sometimes twice a day with Bearskin Lake. Northwest Territories, the top doctors say... The sheer volume of COVID-19 cases will lead to hospitalizations. While only one person is currently in hospital, the latest count has the territory at nearly 2,000 infections. Predominantly the Omicron variant, there have been about 125 new cases a day over the past week in the NWT. And the majority of those cases are in Yellowknife. The territory is waiting to receive its share of 140 million rapid antigen tests promised by the feds. Until that shipment arrives, tests are reserved for priority groups. The territory's medical doctor says the NWT's healthcare system is small and cannot handle thousands of cases. How we prepare for a rising number of cases is to consolidate care um, to the areas that are most critical to keep, uh, to, to keep our system functioning, to make sure that we're able to provide a core package of services to people who become acutely ill and need to access services, um, and to do our best to limit the effects of uh, service interruptions, staff uh, absences from work. Crystal Musso died last year and uh, after the province of Manitoba attempted to transfer her to Ontario to receive medical care during the pandemic. Today, Manitoba NDP leader Wab Kanu, with full support from the Musso family, called for an inquest into her death. Musso was in the intensive care unit at the Brandon Regional Health Centre after contracting COVID-19 in May of 2021. A few days later, she had to be put into a coma to help her lungs. The 31-year-old from Ebb and Flow First Nation was being transferred to Ontario, but there were some complications, so she was moved back to the Brandon Hospital. Shortly after, Musso died. Canoe said an inquest would be able to provide more details than a critical incident investigation, which is currently underway. This incident is being investigated as a critical incident, but there are going to be some answers coming out of that process for the family, but there's also some limitations with that process. It's only within the healthcare system itself, and it's not necessarily going to answer all the outstanding questions that the family has. However, if we call an inquest, it's going to be an independent process. It's going to be a step removed. It's going to have more of an ability to answer those questions that the Musso family has, that Crystal's family uh, has. An update on a story we brought you last year now. You may remember the story of Lillian Vanass, an Ojibwe woman who died while in care of an Alberta hospital 
on December 26th of 2020. Today's investigations into her death are ongoing while her husband still waits for answers as to how she died. APTN's Tamara Pimentel has this update and a warning. Recordings of the incident may be triggering. On Christmas evening in 2020, Corey Ashley recorded this video of his wife Lillian Vanass as she lies in a hospital bed in Hannah, Alberta with difficulty breathing. Lillian from Sandy Bay First Nation woke up Christmas morning not feeling well. Later that night, she had difficulty breathing and was rushed by ambulance to hospital. Corey says he then requested many times for his wife to be given oxygen and that she had been in hospital for almost two hours without it. Frustrated, he began to record. Nurses can be heard saying Lillian had admitted to taking too much methadone, a pain medication prescribed by her family doctor to treat abdominal pain. She had increased her dosage and finished her prescription early as her pain worsened. But a medical examiner told Corey, Lillian died of wet lung. The cause of death still hasn't been determined. Now, a year later, Corey says he is still fighting for justice. Things have to be changed, and I'm fighting for change. I want to see justice for my wife as well. I want to honor her by having change in our medical system to save people. Last January, after her death, he filed a complaint to the College of Physicians and Surgeons of Alberta, who have now included Indigenous investigators to review the complaint. Spokesperson Andrea Garland said CPSA could not comment on specifics, but stated in an email, Part of this work has been looking at how we can do our part in improving Indigenous health and ensuring we stay accountable to our commitment to truth and reconciliation. A step in the right direction for Corey. They're, they're showing respect to the Indigenous cultures, my wife and my, her ways, and, and you know where her background comes from which is a good thing and so it's a college position surgeons first they've never done this before and they're doing it with respect the college and association of registered nurses of alberta have also investigated in december it called two nurses involved in the case to attend a hearing tribunal scheduled for september 2022 on the karna website it stated that if the complaints director determines there is evidence of unprofessional conduct, they may refer a matter to a hearing. And I'm going to continue to fight for it. Every single second of every day, I miss my wife. My wife was everything to me. She was everything to a lot of people. And what they did was wrong. Tamara Pimentel, APTN National News, Calgary. Now the College and Association of Registered Nurses of Alberta could not comment on this case due to the ongoing investigation. The leader of the Bear Clan Patrol in Edmonton says she was banned from a city mall for providing coffee to homeless people. She also says city, or city security removed people from a transit location in extreme cold. APTN's Chris Stewart has that story. The Beaver Hills House Bear Clan Patrol helps the disadvantaged in Edmonton. They patrol the downtown area and for 18 months have provided food and coffee for those who need it. The Bear Clan normally buys coffee from the mall and serves it outside. But Judith Gale, the Bear Clan leader, says they were waiting for a volunteer to use the restroom inside the entrance due to the frigid cold on New Year's Eve. One Paladin security guard working for the mall confronted Gale. He told her she's not allowed to serve coffee inside the mall. She was shocked as the coffee was bought inside the mall. We spend at least $1,200 oh, a month at that mall in an effort to support our brothers and sisters. So for them to, to tell us that we weren't allowed to serve the coffee that we bought 
to our brothers and sisters was just so much wrong to me that I immediately took out my phone and I started videotaping. That escalated the situation. This is going. You're not welcome. I I know that. Trust me. Mom, you know how the one-year ban from since he's under multiple. Yeah. Now it's a one-year ban. You enter, you can be arrested for trespass. Yeah. And I was so upset that this young man, and he was just a young man. He had no humanity in his heart, you know? And it's just so, uh, so disturbing because he is at a remedial job that he is just one paycheck away from being like our brothers and sisters. Absolutely. The general manager and Paladin security met with Gail and called the incident a misunderstanding. The ban has been lifted, but there was no apology. We're not going to be giving them our business any longer. Gail told APTN about another incident that happened at 2 a.m. on January 5th. She says 20 people were seeking shelter at a transit underground tunnel to avoid the minus 41 wind chill. They were awakened by Edmonton Transit Service Security and told to leave. Gail says she saw the group in the morning while on patrol. She said several people had frostbite one with severe frostbite. Michael said he was just having a good sleep when all of a sudden uh, there's five um, ETS and they're kicking him, get up, get up, you gotta get out. It's closed down, can't come back to five. So they kicked him and his girlfriend Nikki out at 2 a.m. Well, um, not only him, there were about uh, 20 other people down there as well. So they kicked everybody, every one of them out. Gail says he doesn't understand why city employees would force people into deadly cold. How could they take our brothers and sisters and kick them out in the cold in that weather at 2 a.m. when there's nothing open. In a statement, the city wrote to APTN stating all individuals leaving the station were provided with options for shelter. A shuttle service arrived and transit peace officers did a call out for transportation to shelter options. Edmonton Mayor Amirjeet Sohi's office told APTN they are reaching out to organizations like the Bear Clan to ensure everyone has a safe space to stay warm as they work towards long-term housing solutions. Chris Stewart, APTN National News, Edmonton. Time for a quick break. Still to come, a major win in a landmark case against the RCMP. Stick around. Welcome back. The BC Civil Liberties Association won a landmark case on RCMP accountability this week. The civil rights organization argued that systemic delays have hurt the public complaint process. And a federal judge has agreed. APTN's Lee Wilson has more. In 2019, BC Civil Liberties Association filed a complaint against the RCMP commissioner due to extreme delays responding to complaints from the Civilian Review and Complaints Commission, the independent oversight body. BCCLA lawyers argued delays limited the ability to get information on police misconduct and held up policy changes. This week, a federal court of Canada judge ruled the RCMP must respond to complaints within six months. Paul Champ, legal counsel for BCCLA, called the decision a huge victory. Uh, reports piled up on the RCMP commissioner's desk for years uh, without a response. And in our view, that was in violation of the act. And um, now with this ruling, it's made it crystal clear that the RCMP uh, shouldn't be taking any longer than six months in responding to public complaints. And this is now going to um, you know, improve that entire process for complaints for Canadians across the country. Lee Wilson, A10 National News, Kitimat. You can watch more on this story on Nation to Nation, which airs tonight, right after the newscast. Well, it was an underwhelming news for MMIWG advocates and their families today. Justice Minister David Lametti announced $300,000 uh, commitment to the MMIWG action plan. The money will go to the Caring Heart Society in Saskatchewan, and we will be doled out over three years. 
Former Head Commissioner Marion Buller joins us now for more. Commissioner Buller, good to see you. Uh, today's announcement of $300,000 over three years doesn't seem like a lot of money to dedicate. To, what was your reaction to the announcement? Well, hello, Dennis, and happy 2022. Uh, my reaction was, well, uh, it's not a lot of money, uh, very similar to your reaction. By my calculations, it's 117000 per year, which really isn't a lot of money to develop a toolkit and uh, get it out, test it, and, and then start uh, distributing it. As you mentioned, we're heading, you're in 2022 here. It's been years now since the inquiry delivered the final report. How would you say uh, the government's doing and uh, implementing those recommendations? Well, oh, how much time do you have, Dennis? Uh, I'll be brief. Uh, I'm very disappointed. Uh, and uh, I have a lot of company, both um, the family members of missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls, and to us people as well as the survivors, in fact, everyone who was involved in the National Inquiry. Plus, we have hundreds of thousands of non-Indigenous allies who were expecting the government to simply do better. So I think it's disappointment all around. How are the ongoing delays affecting the health of MMIWG families and their healing? Well, they're very capable of speaking for themselves. Uh, and I don't want to, to detract from, from what they want to say to the public. But what I can say is overall I've heard uh, it's causing them even more frustration, even more grief, even more pain. We're also seeing more and more cases. This isn't something that has come to an end. Uh, you know, you put out a lot of calls for justice, but are, are there key priorities that you would have hoped uh, that the government would have moved on by now? Uh, well, I'll talk about the federal government in particular, right. but our uh, calls for justice were aimed at all governments, mm -hmm. including Indigenous governments. So having said that, with respect to the federal government, uh, they certainly could have and should have moved on the ombudsperson and the uh, Indigenous Rights Tribunal. They could have moved on the uh, uh, Deputy Commissioner for uh, uh, indigenous matters in corrections. They could have started an annual report as we called for so that they're updating the public, the Canadian public, and internationally too on the progress if any that they're making. And you know, uh, there, there were calls for uh, victim, uh, more funding for victims. There were calls for public education. Uh, these are simple tasks, relatively speaking, and uh, I'm very disappointed that the government hasn't shown us the results of their, and I use air quotes, hard work in uh, uh, developing action plans for the cause for justice. Commissioner, we'll be coming up on another anniversary here of the release of the report in a couple of months' time. Uh, you know, we've blamed uh, things like the pandemic and elections, but are you hopeful that we might see something here soon on the action plan from the federal government? Dennis, I'm always hopeful because there's uh, a, tre a tremendous amount of political will gathering now to push the government ahead. And we know. Uh, the government responds to political will. The government responds to whether they're going to be re-elected or not, uh, or whether they're going to be on the, sitting on the opposition side of, of the chamber. So, um, you know, there's a lot of discontent coming uh, from people who vote, and that's when the government will start to pay attention. We're seeing that on a few different Indigenous issues. Commissioner Buller, we'll have to leave it there, but uh, do t appreciate you taking some time for us. Good to see you. Very happy. Thank you so much, and Happy New Year. Still to come, a pretty sweet job opportunity for aunties in Saskatchewan. Stay with us. Welcome back. Time now for our photo of the day. From deep within the Assiniboine Forest of Winnipeg, Manitoba, our own Charmaine Straker was able to capture this photo of the sun making its way into the horizon during a very cold winter's day. 
If you've got a great picture, you can send it to APTN National News by emailing the photo to share uh, at aptn.ca for the chance to be featured as our next photo of the day. Now let's take a look at tomorrow's weather forecast. Starting on the East Coast, plus four with showers in Halifax, two with snow in Charlottetown. Minus 27 for Kujuac, 20 below with snow in Happy Valley Goose Bay. 16 below in Montreal, minus 24 for Shibugamu. Sun's out, minus 17 in Sault Ste. Marie, 22 below under the sun in North Bay. Minus 25 for Capus Casing, 17 below for Thunder Bay. Minus 25 and sunny in Thompson and God's Lake. Minus 9 in Winnipeg, snow and 16 below for Brandon. 11 below and snow in Regina, minus 9 and partly cloudy for Saskatoon. Minus 6 in Buffalo Narrows and Meadow Lake. In northern Alberta, minus 2 for Fort McMurray, 6 below in Peace River. 0 for Edmonton and Red Deer, plus Four in Lethbridge. Nine above with rain in Vancouver. Eight and showers in Victoria. Plus four in Prince George. Plus three with snow in Smithers. Minus 20 in Old Crow. Seven below with snow in Whitehorse. Minus 10 with flurries in Yellowknife. 25 below in snow in Norman Wells. Minus 26 for Saks Harbor. 29 below in Politak. Snow and minus 26 in Chesterfield, 32 below for Cambridge Bay, minus 33 in Arctic Bay, 32 below in Aglooly. The Saskatchewan Indian Institute of Technologies has a unique employment opportunity as it gets ready to launch a new entrepreneurship program in Saskatoon. They're looking for an anti in residence to support the first group of students. Course developers wanted to ensure Indigenous values were embedded in the program. That's where the Antian residence idea was born. Requirements to be an Antian residence include being personable, nurturing, knowledgeable of Indigenous culture, and experience with entrepreneurship. Eight people applied immediately when the job was posted and more are expected before the end of the month deadline. Elders are significant and aunties in our uh, families are very important as well and they work alongside um, with elders. So for those people who, who aren't familiar, you know, aunties are often second parents, they're role models, they're often guiding us with a stern hand, a stern voice, but still offer um, that compassionate encouragement, um, almost like a, a compass for, for the younger members in the communities, right? Well, in just a matter of minutes, Brett Forrester will deliver the latest episode of Nation to Nation. But first, here's a look ahead. Brett? The massive $40 billion agreements on child and family services between First Nations and Canada have been widely celebrated, but they still must be ratified and some important details remain unclear. Tonight, I'll speak with two of the plaintiffs who put their name forward to lead this claim. We'll discuss what compensation and reform would mean to them and why they got involved in the case. Plus, an interview with human rights lawyer Paul Champ about the recent court ruling that scolded the Mounties for failing to respond to complaints. That's on Nation and Nation right after the news. Thanks, Brett. That's next. That's all the time we have for your APTN National News for this Thursday. I'm Dennis Ford. Have a great night. See you back here tomorrow.